Welcome to episode 259 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. <laughs> Jason, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm okay, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, yeah, not not too much to share on my end. We had some nasty weather here this week, but we're fine. How about you? You just had a minor hurricane blow over. Yeah, just a minor hurricane. It, it didn't really affect us here at all. It wasn't even still a category one when it hit. Yeah, uh, you you guys, was it? I don't think so. I don't think so either. It's funny. I mean, I I may have mentioned this already on the podcast before, but every single time that they predict that a floor that a hurricane is going to make landfall near Cocoa Beach, Merritt Island area, which is where uh, Cape Canaveral is, mm-hmm. you know that it's wrong because a hurricane has never made landfall on Cape Canaveral. It would have destroyed Kennedy Space Center 50 years ago if it had. It never does. So I'm like, oh, well, my parents live right around there. I guess they'll be fine since it's predicted to hit them. <laughs> it, it just always bounces off. I think there's something about the shape of the island, honestly, that might affect it because it juts Maybe. out right there. Hopefully you're not jinxing them by pointing this out, though. No, it's been several years I've been pointing it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, at the top of the episode, I'd like to hear a piece of feedback. Uh, this week we got a tweet uh, about just listen to episode 256. Uh, appreciated the discussion around LLVM modules, C++ modules, and pre-compiled headers. I've been working with PCH support via CMake and have been really pleased. It's letting me give thought to how I will organize my C++ modules when I get them. That's from uh, Bowie on Twitter. Yeah, and the recent PCH support that's built into CMake is actually really good. Having hand-rolled that stuff in CMake scripts in the past, it's so much nicer to just be able to turn it on. Nice. Is it pretty similar to the way PCHs have worked in Visual Studio for a while now? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. all the same idea. It's just with CMake having it built in, you just get to say, enable PCH for this project and have nice. these four header files included or whatever. And it just does it regardless nice. of platform. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Ian Taylor. Ian has been writing free software since 1990. He is the main author of Taylor UUCP, the Gold Linker, and the Go Frontend GCC. He is a member of the GCC Steering Committee. He joined Google in 2006 and since 2008 has been working on the Go programming language. Ian, welcome to the show. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Wow, the gold linker, that made quite the splash when it was first announced. I remember lots of people talking about it. Yeah, that was uh, that was a while ago now. That was around 2007, I guess. Um, but yeah, just a uh, much faster uh, linking speed. Um, still, being, still being used today. Uh, there's also LLD now, which uh, is even faster. But um, I don't know, gold still has its place. I didn't realize LLD was still faster. I always kind of found it surprising that gold didn't just become the de facto standard because it was so much faster. Yeah, I um, I didn't push it as hard once I switched to working as Go. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's cool anyhow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, Ian, we'll start talking more about uh, what you've worked on in the past, including uh, working on the Go language. Uh, but first, got a couple of news articles to discuss, so feel free to comment on any of these, okay? Sure. Okay, so this first one is uh, joining join the new Conan 2.0 tribe, and this is on the Conan blog. And this is kind of interesting. I guess they're they're working towards a 2.0 version of Conan, and they're basically inviting, you know, power users of Conan to give them lots of feedback on the direction of 2.0. Yes, that sounds right. Yeah. And they're also doing some online classes, which is cool, because they were planning on having a, uh, a conference in Madrid, but that's been postponed, obviously. Yeah, it sounds like their online sessions sell out, sell out. I think they're free. Or, no, maybe they're not free. But regardless, they sell out really fast. So if you yeah. see one announced and you're interested, sign up as soon as you can. Yeah. You're still using Conan, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's used on, uh, I mean, besides my personal projects, two projects that I'm paid to work on at the moment. Nice. I can save us a lot of effort when you're like, oh, I, I just need speed log real quick. I'm just going to add it to the Conan script and it's good. 
that's it's pretty handy. Yeah, definitely. You have any experience with working with some of the C++ package managers, Ian? I don't really. Um, sorry to say. Uh, I've mostly, uh, I usually, most of my work's been pretty low level in the stack, so uh, I don't need to pull in a lot of packages uh, beyond the pretty extensive C++ standard library. Right. Just out of curiosity, I mean, maybe it's a slight diversion, but does Go have a package manager that's a standard package manager? Go does have a package manager. Um, it has uh, a whole module system, and um, there's uh, a website, package.go.dev, um, okay. which uh, handles packages for you. So. Okay. Uh, next thing we have is a blog post, C++ 70 times faster file embeds using string literals. And uh, this is a tool that you can check out to you know, embed content into your C++ binaries, and uh, he did some performance testing comparing it to XXD, and it is significantly faster and uses uh, much less RAM, uh, so it's definitely worth checking out, although the whole time I'm reading this, I just keep thinking about uh, Jean Heed's work to try to get stood embed into the language. Of course, yes. <laughs> Which hopefully is going to, you know, make some more progress. But this is actually really interesting, because many of us who have done this in the the past have done it with mm -hmm. like bin hex or something like that and embedded, you know, whatever, all kinds of other options. I'm a little disappointed that this is using escaped bytes instead of using raw string literals because I'd be very curious to see if that made a difference also. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely go with raw string literals for something like that. But it may not make that much of a difference. I would expect that the uh, time taken... Um, with just bytes, it's just, you know, allocating all the memory to store all the information for each individual byte, which it turn out, turns out you don't need, but compilers kind of does it automatically. Yeah, that's a good point. Rostering literals I probably wouldn't make much of a difference. It might, I'm wondering if it would make your editor choke that much harder, seeing that, right. like, <laughs> all these, like, non-printable characters in the middle and stuff, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then the last thing we have here is a list of all the online C++ user group meetings in August, and this is on Meeting C++'s blog, and uh, yeah, lots of good user groups that are going online, and you know, you don't have to live anywhere near some of these cities to, uh, to attend as long as you can, uh, you know, log on at the right time. Yeah, mine is tomorrow, so it's too late for anyone listening to this. Right, but uh, it's been interesting because I, I can't recall if I've mentioned this on the show or not. We've had people from like Thailand come to our meetup, um, so it's got to be hard to do, but good for them. Well, for them, it's this guy. It was like early in the morning as he's oh, you know okay. just getting his day started. Uh, for people, people from Europe have also come, and it's like two o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, why aren't you sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Ian, so I don't think we've ever really talked about the Go language on the show before. Could you start off with just giving us a description of Go for listeners who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, sure. So Go is a programming language. It's a, uh, you know an open source language that was originally developed at Google. Um, it's, uh, it's in the C family of languages for sure. It's got um, a syntax that would be familiar to anybody uh, who uses C++. Um, you know, curly braces and all that. Uh, it's designed to be a simple language um, with um, a small number of constructs, a small number of keywords, uh, very easy to pick up and learn, um, especially for anyone who knows C++. Um, it's designed to work well for uh, multi-threaded environments. It has multi-threading support built into the language directly uh, without needing any library calls. So you can start a new um, a new thread of execution, which in Go is called a Go routine. Um, Go routines are actually not threads in the C++ sense, but Go routines are multiplexed onto threads. So you can have mm -hmm. uh, many, many Go routines. Uh, and um, the runtime also handles the stack for you, so you never run out of stack space until you run out of memory. Um, it's also a garbage collected language. So uh, the runtime manages all memory for you, and you don't have to track it yourself. Um, 
And yeah, it's a simple language. It's designed mostly for uh, writing networking servers. Um, it can be used, but you know, people use it for all kinds of things. It's, I mean, obviously it's Turing complete, can be used for anything. And uh, it's, it's still steadily gaining in popularity, much to my surprise. <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's doing well out in the ecosystem out there. It's used for a lot of cloud services. Um, it's uh, what Docker was written in, and uh, you know, if you're in the if you're in the cloud space, uh, Kubernetes was written in Go, and uh, many similar tools. I had no idea, honestly. Yeah. Never stopped to think about it. <laughs> so you just mentioned how it's used in in some of these cloud tools and networking services. Uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit about the history of Go, why it was created, and and you know why they felt this new language was necessary? Yeah, absolutely. It was started in 2007 by um, Rob Pike, Ken Thompson, and Robert Riesemer. So some pretty well-known names there in the computer science field. Um, and uh, there were, the main reason for starting it, uh, I mean, there were various reasons for starting it, but one of them was just slow build times. Um, at the time, they were all three at Google at the time, um, and, and they still are. Uh, it took, um, it took, it could take half an hour to build a program, a big C++ program. Um, and uh, they also were looking at um, the changes coming in C++, um, the new features added, and it seemed clear the language was on a path of increased complexity, completely understandably. But they thought that there might be room, there might be space in the ecosystem for a language, you know, with a different perspective, um, a language that aimed more at simplicity and ease of use rather than um, getting, you know, the very last possible execution time improvement. Uh, and a language that would build much faster uh, for Google scale C++ programs. And in general, a language that would scale uh, to support Google servers. Um, so we started, you know, as an experiment, really. I mean, what can we do with this language? And, you know, hoping to generate ideas that might get pulled into other languages. But it turned out that it kind of caught on. Um, I joined the project in 2008, and then uh, along with Russ Cox, who's the current uh, lead, and a, then in 2009, it went open source. It was announced to the world. Um, and in 2012, version 1.0 was released. And, uh, you know, we've just carried on since there. Um, we were about to release uh, 115. Um, and I should add that there's, uh, when I say 115, I mean sort of a, the main Go installation. But, it, you know, it's a language that's defined by a specification. There's multiple Go compilers. Both GCC and LLVM support Go. Um, and there's also a tiny Go, which aims aimed more at embedded systems. Oh. Um, so, but, but, you know, but there is a one main Go compiler, which is the one that most people use. And that's the one that's about to have a 115 release and the one that kind of drives development of the language and libraries. So... It sounds like you were involved in the project before it was made official. You were also working at Google at the time? That's right. I was work I, I still work at Google. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I joined the project um, when people at Google started talking about it, but before it had been uh, publicly announced. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly kind of curious because some of the most interesting projects that I've been involved in at work is things that I just volunteered for and kind of weaseled my way into that project. <laughs> Did you do the same thing here? <laughs> That's pretty much what happened, actually. <laughs> I found out about Go, and I, I've been thinking about, you know, what's a good, what, you know, I've been thinking about multi-threading um, issues at the time. You know, that was back when it was becoming really obvious that, uh, we weren't going to get better clock speed in our processors, but we were going to get more and more cores in our machines. So we needed ways to write programs to take advantage of those more and more cores. And I've been thinking about that in the context of C++. I was a C++ programmer. I still am a C++ programmer. And um, but then, uh, you know, I heard about this new language, Go, and I saw that it was with its built-in support for concurrency, which, by the way, was based on... Um, ideas that started from with Tony Hoare in the 70s called communicating sequential processes and uh, which Rod Pike had experimented on with various languages when he was at Bell Labs. So anyhow, I heard about this language and I thought, this is an interesting language. Um, I should try it out. And so I wrote um, a front end for GCC to support that language. And then I went to the Go team with just the three of them at the time. And I said, hey, I've got this extra Go compiler. Are you interested? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that they, you know, invited me to join the project and uh, been there ever since. Awesome. 
and I think if I'm, I'm reading between the lines here, the Go compiler for GCC, the Go, Go front end, must also be written in C++. That's correct, yes. Okay. The main Go, I mean, the main Go compiler is written in Go, but yeah, the front end for GCC is written in C++. So one question I have, uh, we've had several developers from Google on the show over the years working on, you know, various C++ projects at Google. And obviously there's room for lots of different programming languages in the company as large as Google. But uh, what are some of the projects that are using Go uh, internally at Google that you could tell us about? Sure. Well, I already mentioned Kubernetes, for example. Okay. Right. Um, quite a large project, all written in Go. Uh, there's... Um, there's a lot of uh, smaller um, projects at Google um, written in Go. A lot of the sort of uh, infrastructure for the company, um, a lot of the internal tools are written in Go. Um, the download server that you contact whenever you download a new version of Chrome or whatever, that's all written in Go. Yeah. Um, a lot of the uh, logs processing done within Google, and there's a lot of log processing done in Google. That's almost entirely written in Go. Um, those are some of the examples. Um, I don't even know all the ways it's used in the company. As you say, there's a lot of languages used in the company. Go, it's not dominant by any means, but it's quite popular. Okay. As you're working on this front end in C++ to write the Go language, how often do you find yourself going, oh, I wish I had this feature in Go, or I wish I had this feature in C++, or whatever? <laughs> um, you know, they're different languages. Uh, I mean... When I program in Go, I get used to garbage collection. And then when I go back to C++, it's like, ah, oh, you know, now I have to track all my memory again. Um, but uh, uh, not, so, not so often, I guess, is the truth. I, I, I guess I just adopt a different mindset for each one. They have different goals and purposes and uses. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, does Go interop well with C and C++? Um, it's not great. It interops fairly well, yeah. Okay. Um, with C, I should say. It interops fairly well with C. Go has a, a built-in support for, um, you can sort of, you, you do, in Go, you, you bring in other packages with an import statement, which is, you know, sort of similar to the C++ sharp include. Um, and so you can literally import C. And... Um, then there's a way to say, when I import C, I want these headers, I want to be able to call these functions, and then, you know, in your Go code, you can just uh, call them directly. Um, so it's actually quite easy to use. Uh, the main disadvantage is it's somewhat slow. Um, mm -hmm. Go uh, actually uses a different calling convention, so you have to wow. click on the conventions, and you also have to tell the scheduler, okay, now I'm leaving the Go routine world, and I'm entering the C++ world, so it's like a every function call takes like 10 times longer than it really ought to. So it's hard to do very, it's very quick, you know, it's hard to call just a very tiny function and see and come back. I mean, it's easy to do it, but it'll slow down your program more than you think, more than it ought to. Hmm. Um, and then there's also direct support for calling C++ via SWIG. If you're familiar with SWIG, it's a general tool for calling C++ from other languages and it supports Go as well. It seems interesting to me that, you know, uh, basically a language cannot succeed if there's no way to call a C function from it. I think that's absolutely true. C has kind of become the lingua franca that everyone, every other language has to support. And it puts us, it's good, you know, lets other languages call through C to any other language. Yeah. So do you want to maybe uh, go into some more detail on some of the major features of Go? We already talked a little bit about uh, Go routines. Are there any other kind of major highlights we should discuss? Um, go routines and channels are the big ones. So a Go routine lets you start uh, a new execution thread. As I say, it's not the same as a, as a thread in C++. Um, and then channels are a way to communicate between Go routines. Um, you, can you, you can say I have a channel of int or whatever type, and then you can just, you know, one Go routine can write a value to the channel and another Go routine can read from the channel. No, not that exciting. The nice thing is that it's built into the language. And then the other main feature there is the select statement, which lets you select on a whole set of channels and say, whichever one of these is ready first, you know, that's the one I want. And so a select is like a switch statement, except you're switching on a set of channels. It'll just sit there until some channel gets some data written to it. Then you'll pick it up and you'll execute that block of code. Um, these are sort of the core features of the uh, the core aspects of the uh, 
uh, multi-threaded support in Go. Um, but you know, beyond that, as I say, Go is quite a simple language. Um, it doesn't have uh, very much in the way of you know exotic language features, uh, unless you consider garbage collection, you know, the exotic. But uh, beyond beyond those, um, it's intended to be a language you can you know an experienced programmer can literally learn the whole language in a day or two. Oh wow. And, You'll just you just know every, you just know everything there is about it. It's got I think twenty five keywords, um, maybe uh, fifteen built in types. Uh, it does have I guess I should say you know unusually compared to a language like C plus plus, it has uh, maps are uh, built into the language, mm -hmm. um, okay. and uh, um, so should we start talking about generics now? Or, uh, <laughs> sure. Um, if you would like Go to, does, yeah. Go does not have generics right now, um, and one of the one of my main projects for the last few years have been figuring out how to add generics to Go while keeping it um, a simple language that's still easy to learn and okay. easy to use. And so we've gone through. Uh, I've been working closely with Robert Riesemer, one of the original uh, developers of the language, um, and many other people to uh, try to figure out a way to have the generic capabilities while keeping it, you know, as I say, simple and easy to use and true to the spirit of Go, whatever that is. Okay, so that's interesting because I, I was looking at, I think, Go's Frequently Asked Questions page, and it, it has a, a note there about, you know, deliberately not including features uh, from some other languages, and generics is one of the ones mentioned there. But you're saying you are trying to add generics, you're just trying to do it in kind of a way that fits in with Go? That's right, exactly. I mean, there are clear uses for generics in Go, just as there are in, in any other language, but, um, but we haven't had them. Um, and uh, some people miss them badly. Some people say, well, we really don't need them. You know, I can, I mean, the, you know, since maps are built into the language, I can, uh, I can do almost anything I need to. Uh, I just, you know, I just write the specific type I want instead of having a general purpose data structure or a general purpose function. But and that, but there are many people who want them, and uh, we're trying to figure out how to add them um, in a in a clean way. We've got a design draft out there that I think is uh, doing pretty well with the Go community. I think um, you know there's still a lot of discussion about it, but I think most people are in favor of it. That's my sense of it. And so we're hoping to. Uh, I mean, the most optimistic possible would be that we can have add generics around the Go 117 release, uh, which would be about a year from now. What can, is it possible to describe what these look like, uh, maybe to listeners who are familiar with C++ templates? Um, it's not dissimilar from templates. Um, it's uh, it's um, a form of it's uh, polymorphic parameters. Um, okay. Each function or type can have a set of type arguments, um, which is uh, you know they can have their type arguments, and then a function can also have its regular arguments. Um, the type arguments are just can just be you know any type, and then you can use the type within the function. Um, each uh, each type argument has what we call a constraint, um, which some other languages call a bound, and it's uh, in the same space as uh, what C plus plus calls concepts. Okay. You can say um, this is the uh, this type argument has to um, implement uh, these, you know, any type argument for this type parameter has to implement these features. It has to have these characteristics, which in Go we would say it has to have these methods. Mm -hmm. um, and then within the body of the function, you can only use methods that are, uh, that the type parameter is required to have. Um, and there's another way to handle operators like plus and uh, less, less than and so on. So um, the idea being that uh, you can compile the generic code. You can compile the generic code with a constraint, and then you can uh, call it with some type argument. And I mean, there's various different imp implementation strategies, but you can call it with some type argument, and you can know that the type argument is guaranteed to work. Um, we're specifically trying to avoid uh, the problem that C++ compilers used to have in the past, where you'd make some mistake in the type you pass to a template, and you'd, you'd spit out, you know, 30 lines of error messages. I mean, they're a lot better now. But uh, now you not have always. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to des you have to describe in the function exactly what kind of type you accept, and then uh, we can check that at the instantiation. We can check right at the top, so to speak. You know, oh, this type doesn't meet the requirements, so we can reject it right there instead of 
finding out, you know, 20 calls down that the type argument doesn't quite work. Um, and, and, you know, then there's details about syntax, which of course gets a lot of discussion because syntax is easy to talk about. Um, and there's uh, other details about exactly how to fit it into specific aspects of Go. But, but that's the basic idea. It's not, as I say, it's not dissimilar from templates, but I should say one way it's different from templates is we don't have any specialization in this design. Um, so, you know, C++ has this really cool feature that you can use the templates themselves are a Turing complete language. Yeah. Um, so you can, so C++ is like, I'd like to think of it as like two languages wrapped in one. There's the regular language, and then there's the compile time language, which unfortunately uses a completely different syntax, but it's still <laughs> um, quite powerful. But uh, that's not the kind, as I say, Go aims for simplicity. That's not the kind of power we want to have in Go, um, that not the kind of complexity we want to have in Go. So there's, there's no support for specialization. There's no support for sort of uh, substitution failure doesn't exist in Go. So um, it's much simpler than the C++ approach in those ways. So if it meets the constraint, then it'll compile. If it doesn't, then it won't kind of. Exactly. So we, we haven't explicitly said this, but it sounds like Go is a strongly typed, statically typed language. All, yeah, everything's not a compile time. That's right. I should have mentioned that. It is statically typed language. It is a, a statically typed language with sort of, uh, it has, it has dynamic components in that it has what Go calls interface types, which are similar to what C++ would call an abstract base class. Um, and... Uh, an abstract base class in which none of the virtual, in which all the virtual methods had an equal zero after them. Like a Java interface. Like a Java interface, that's right. Okay. Uh, and it also has um, type reflection that's available at runtime. Nice. Um, for, uh, for any type. So it has those dynamic layers over it, but, um, but it, it is hard. It's a statically typed, uh, stat and it's statically compiled language. Yeah, it compiles to a machine executable just like C++ does. So you can do um, function overloading type kind of things as well. Well, but, well, but except that Go doesn't have function overloading in the C++ sense. Um, oh, okay. In Go, every function, you know, a func you, you can only define a function name once. So it's oh. <clears throat> it has exactly those types. And if you want to overload it, you've got to give it a different name. Um, okay. Oh. It was that, that again, is a, you know, I mean, it's, it's a great feature in C++, but it's a kind of complexity that we wanted to avoid. Um, in Go, and so, um, and I, and while we're at it, I should mention that another aspect of Go is that it doesn't have implicit type conversion. I was just um, going to ask. Yeah, which was one of the uh, that was you know that was a deliberate omission by the original language developers. They're like, we've seen bugs over the years, especially as you know migrate from one platform to another. We've seen bugs in implicit type conversion in C and C plus plus. So it just doesn't exist in Go. You always have to explicitly convert your uh, your types. Yeah, I'm I'm close to saying that if I could remove something from C plus plus, it would be implicit type conversion. <laughs> It's rare that it's exact. It's actually what I want. It's more likely that it caused some performance overhead or bug that I didn't want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can definitely surprise me. What are some other features that were deliberately omitted? Uh, we talked about generics. That is going to change in the future. Uh, implicit type conversion. I think I also saw assertions. Yeah, um, assertions um, were omitted. Uh, I was, you know, it was, it was that was more of an attitude of um, we wanted people. We'd seen um, that test suites at Google had kind of developed this almost another language, um, which was which dis was written to which described your test. You'd say like assert equals this and that, and your test would just turn into a whole set of assertion statements um, with function calls embedded in the assertion statements. And it just felt like uh, Rob Pike was a big person to push it. This he was like it was like let's not put another language in here. Let's uh, write your test using the existing language, which does mean, you know, more if statements. Um, but the benefit, the benefit, the perceived benefit at least is, um, first, as you don't have to learn this whole assertion language. But secondly, um, you tend to get better error messages when you're forced to actually write out those error messages. Um, and that leads me to another thing, which is that Go is a language which um, is okay with verbosity. Let me mm. put it that way. Um, Go doesn't mind... Uh, making you write something out explicitly, um, even if 
you wind up writing the same thing, you know, multiple times. It's design, It's e always easy to read, um, but there is more writing required sometimes. And then there's error handling. Go doesn't really have exceptions. I mean, there's a sense in which it does, but in practice it doesn't. So error handling is almost always done with an explicit error check. You call a function, it returns an error. You say, "Is there? did I get an error? If I did get an error, let's do something. And so, uh, you know, let's handle that error. Let's return the modification of the error. Let's just return that error itself up to my caller. Um, there's none of this... Uh, skip levels of flow of control the exceptions there's no catching exceptions not in ordinary go code at least and so that adds a lot of boilerplate to go programs it's absolutely true and it's one of the big criticisms people have about go but um and you know there have been many discussions about how to simplify it although none of them have really caught on so far but it's just part of the approach of go as i say it's okay to be a little verbose to make your program really explicitly clear um, so then when you go back and read it, when you read your own program a year later or when someone else reads your program, there's no, uh, it minimizes confusion. So Go is so willing, willing to make that trade-off. When you return an error code, is there any way of telling the compiler this is an error code so that it can at least uh, alert if you ignore it in some way or anything like that? Um, the compiler doesn't do that, but um, there are uh, linters that can... Uh, do that okay. kind of thing for you. Um, Go has a pretty uh, sophisticated set of uh, vet programs and link programs to examine code for all kinds of different checks. Um, because Go is a simple language, it's quite easy to add new linters. Um, it's very easy to parse Go programs. Uh, so there's a pretty sophisticated set of those tools. We, in, in general, Go tries to leave those kind of checks out of the compiler proper. Um, just to make sure we uh, speed up the, uh, you know, we keep the compiler as fast as possible and okay. uh, run checks as a, you know, in a separate tool on a separate process. I feel like the languages that I am more familiar with, because I haven't programmed in any Go at all, just for the record, like uh, Lua and Lisp that are like, we, we are simple languages. They end up being simple in a way that makes the code like impossible to, and from my perspective because in Lua everything's a table in Lisp everything's a parenthesis right like I mean I'm exaggerating here but um, it seems like a very fine line to walk to try to keep the language functional and relevant and usable and constrain this complexity. I totally hear you um, you're right Go's trying to walk a pretty fine line and um, I mean, there are many days when I'm surprised how popular the language has gotten. So, you know, I feel like, I mean, people, some people at least are, are voting for it. So, you know, that's great. And I don't know how long it's going to continue that way. But, um, I mean, I hope indefinitely I like the language a lot. Um, part of what happened is, um, I mean, I'm stressing kind of the simplicity and so on, but I should also mention the development methodology which the original language designers used, which was they said, you know, okay, we're going to write a language, you know, and they laid down some basic features pretty early on. But then every time they wanted to add a feature to a language, they, they did it by writing code in Go. They wrote real programs in Go to see how it felt to them and to see what problems they encountered. And then they would say, you know, like, I just keep running into this wall right here. It's so painful to write this kind of code and go, we got to figure out how to address this. And then they would talk about it and uh, figure out some way to handle it. Um, they wouldn't add a feature unless all three of them agreed that it was required uh, to make the language better. So I think, you know, perhaps a little, I, I'm less familiar with Lua, but Lisp kind of developed from a kind of a vision. Um, go developed from a practice. Go developed from a, a practical programming steps to see what was needed and what, you know, and and only added what was needed. So I think that's part of um, what's helped it be, uh, be fairly successful, that it really developed out of, you know, what people really do need um, as they're writing real code. What's the development of the Go language look like today? Is it still these three core developers who are kind of approving new features, or is it more of an open process now? Um, it's it's an open process now. I mean, it's an open source language, uh, although I should say that um, the real core developers do still work at Google. But, uh, we get a lot of contributions from outside. Um, 
as far as but but you know a lot of those are of course to the libraries mm -hmm. um as far as the language itself goes um there is a uh a proposal process that we go through to uh, see what we're going to add to the language, but the language does not change very much. It's fairly stable, um, and that's by that's intentional. Um, okay. There's not a goal of adding a lot of things to the language or continuing to experiment. No, the language is meant to be pretty stable at this point. So, uh, aside from you know big features like generics, uh, most of the changes to the language are more small things. You know, more things where we sort of seeing that people are running into little problems here. We can make it just a little bit smoother. Um, there isn't an expectation of adding any big new features or any radical changes to the language at this point. Standard library? Does it have one? Yeah, it has a quite an extensive standard library. Um, since it was designed uh, as to be a language that works with network servers, it has, um, you know, it has full HTTP and HTML support in the, lib in the standard nice. library that comes with every Go installation. Uh, it has a wide range of cryptographic protocols because they are not to be required um, for, uh, you know, talking to all kinds of different places on the net. Um, it's got, I mean, it's got regular expressions. It's got all the basics, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got other stuff that I'm not thinking of. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty big standard library. And then there's a whole lot of third-party packages um, available out there for uh, all kinds of different uses. Hopefully by 2023, we'll have networking in the C++ standard library. <laughs> Hopefully. So are you familiar enough with C++20's coroutines to give us a comparison for how they compare to Go routines? Unfortunately, I'm not. Um, I have seen the coroutine support. Um, I think, you, you know, I, I'm kind of guessing here. But one nice feature of Go routines is that the runtime handles the stack for you. So if you can do a deeply recursive call, you can use up, you know, megabytes or theoretically even gigabytes of stack, and the runtime will just allocate that for you. And then as you return out, um, if you don't need that stack for a while, the runtime will say, well, you're not using the stack anymore. It'll take it away and, you know, make it available to some other Go routines. So, um, I mean, obviously, all of this costs a little bit of execution time efficiency, but it makes it very easy for the programmer. You don't have to think about um, stack usage at all. So does, do C++ coroutines have that feature, or do you have to say how big the stack is going to be? They, they are. I know that the C++ 20 coroutines are heap allocated, but aside from that, I don't know how it deals with its own stack on that portion of heap space that's been allocated to it. Okay. So, yeah. I definitely have a lot to learn still. So <clears throat> Yeah, as I say, I don't do coroutines, but I suspect that other than that, they're probably pretty similar, except that in Go, it's just you know built into the language directly. You don't have to make a library call. Right. So I, th I feel like, uh, just maybe to s clarify here, if you hear that Go is a deliberately simple language with few features, you you immediately want to maybe jump to the conclusion of, oh, okay, well, the language is stagnant, but it sounds like it's really not stagnant. You are continuing to develop on it. We are continuing to develop on it. That's right. Um, and we're continuing to develop the uh, libraries quite actively. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it's stagnant, but, you know, I would say it's a language that moves at a deliberate pace. And it sounds like the front end that you work on, the GCC one, is kind of the secondary one. Uh, is that right? That's okay. right. Yeah. Uh, um, it, is a se it is a secondary one. Um, but, but it does work well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it does support many more targets than the standard Go compiler because it's just a front end for GCC. So it automatically supports, you know, every architecture that GCC supports, which, of course, is quite a few. Yeah, and GCC's architecture support is still wider than LLVMs two even i believe that's true yeah so um i, I just was leading somewhere with that question now and i forget <laughs> what it was shoot oh is there a published language specification yeah absolutely okay um golang.org slash ref slash spec uh will uh We'll bring it up to you. Um, yeah, um, one of the big advantages we've had from having multiple compilers is ensuring that the language specification describes the language. We definitely right. wanted to avoid the problem where the implementation defines the language, like in early versions of Perl or whatever. So we wanted to make it very clear, this is the language. And 
I mean, this written down spec is a language, not whatever we happen to implement. And it's helped us a lot over the years to say, although this turns out like this spec is unclear because suddenly we'd see the two, the two implementations. I mean, now there's more than two, but at the time we'd see the two implementations were doing something different and be like, okay, we better clarify that. Yeah, that's, that's actually where I was hoping to get to there because I, I, uh, it seems like the work, it's easy to undervalue the work that you're doing. The work that you're doing is incredibly important to making sure that this language does what they think that it does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're going where we're where we're that. But yeah, it's a good point. Thank you for pointing it out. Okay. Uh, is there anything else that you want to talk about with Go before we move on? Anything we haven't discussed already? About features I would, or I would try to encourage people to try it out. You know, okay. I mean, when, when thinking about C plus plus versus Go, C plus plus is of course a more complex language, but um. But C++ will give you the ability to get that last little bit of execution time. C++ programs, you know, a, a, a well-tuned C++ program is always going to be faster than a well-tuned Go program. I think there's, there's no doubt about that. But, you know, if you're writing networking code where your program actually is almost always just waiting for the network, mm -hmm. who cares? Um, so I'd encourage people to give Go a try. It's a, as I say, it's a very easy to language to pick up. Um, hopefully, the uh, Go routine support in particular will give you some ideas of how to write your C++ code. And, uh, you know, see what you think. See if you like it. I might have to check that out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you've mentioned UUCP, Goldlinker, and GCC, and you said you've been working on open source software since 1990. Are there any other projects you're involved in right now besides Go? Um, no. Go is, Go is definitely the big one. I mean, I have some some tiny little projects of my own, like a backtrace library um, that's gotten pretty popular, but uh, oh. nothing oh. nothing substantial. Back what is the for? backtrace library? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a little, it's a little library that you can um, link in. It's, a, it's written in uh, C, and so you can link it into your, um, your program and you can get a stack backtrace at runtime. Um, it's mainly designed so that if your program crashes, it can print out a stack backtrace when it crashes, but then it's also used, people wind up using it for uh, various other purposes as well. Um, it's, used, it's used by the Rust tool chain, for example. But what is the name of that? That's definitely be of some interest. Oh, it's just called libbacktrace. Oh, uh, okay. So that one's, is, if it's what I'm thinking of, it's been around for, you've been in development for a while, right? Yeah, maybe five years. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, can, that's awesome. <laughs> Does it uh, so work uh, cross-platform? Um, it, it, yeah, it, it, um, I, I didn't write it, but it supports Windows and, uh, and Mac OS, um, as well as uh, pretty much all Unix systems. Oh, and the other cool thing is you can run it from a signal handler and get a correct backtrace out of a signal handler. So. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show today, Ian. Um, is there anything else you want to let us know before we let you go? Any uh, where, where can listeners find you online too? Uh, I have a blog, but I haven't updated it in years. So uh, <laughs> you can find me. Uh, you can find me on the Go mailing lists. Basically, that's um, ent at golang dot org. Um, I'm not really a social media user. Sorry to say, uh, but uh, yeah, shoot me an email. And, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. It's been great chatting. Thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks for, for coming, coming on the show. Us. Awesome.